This video is made possible by Practical Defense Systems, the best online security training at the lowest prices. You can start your security career today online at pdsclasses.com. Check them out. Hi, this is Joel Persinger. I'm the Gun Guy. Thank you very much for all of your support of Gun Guy TV. I am very, very grateful. Earlier today, I had an opportunity to sit down with Chuck Michelle and to talk about what's going on with the Supreme Court of the United States and the cases they chose not to take, as well as some that they may take in the future. And I think the courts and litigation in general. So we had a far reaching, broad conversation about all of that. As a result, the interview is kind of long, but I'll tell you, when you get a chance to sit down with Chuck, it's a great time to learn a lot about what's happening in the courts with our Second Amendment rights. Chuck is the uh, owner and or senior partner or whatever you call it of Michelle and Associates. He is a crackerjack attorney. He is also the volunteer president of the California Rifle and Pistol Association. He's been involved in the fight for your Second Amendment rights for a long, long time, and he's extremely knowledgeable. So this interview is kind of long. I do apologize for that, but it is also very detailed. So I, I do suggest you watch it. Let's get to the interview. Chuck, I'm very grateful that you're on the show because people ask me questions all the time. And as you know, I'm not an expert on any of this. If you want to go learn to shoot, I can do that. But as far as the rest of this stuff, you're really the expert. So please enlighten us. And I'm very grateful you sent me some things we can talk about, which is really cool. But please enlighten us. In particular, I guess two questions that come up a lot are, what happened with the 10 or so cases that uh, SCOTUS had but decided not to grant cert to? And, uh, and why do you think that might have been? And then also, it seems like people are really taking swipes at Chief Justice John Roberts now, assuming that he's got some, uh, some anti-gun agenda there. And I don't know whether it's safe to assume that or not. So what are your thoughts? Well, okay. So first of all, remember how we got to where we're at. We had Heller in 2008, McDonald in 2010. And ever since then, everybody, including every, you know, a wannabe, uh, uh, a Supreme Court litigator lawyer uh, has been trying to get another case back to the, the Supreme Court to resolve the issue of the standard of review. Everybody knew that that was the next question that we needed resolved because the higher that standard, the more gun laws, ill-conceived gun laws will be struck down as Second Amendment infringements. So that's been the fight. The courts have bent over backwards to try not to have a very high standard. They want to really uh, allow pretty much any gun control law, no matter how pointless or how uh, onerous on gun owners, they want to let them all stand. We've had a number of very significant selected victories and some great dissents by judges who understand what the Heller and McDonald case were really all about and what those opinions mandated. But we've had a lot of uh, courts that have really twisted the law to uphold gun laws that should not be that should be deemed unconstitutional. Okay, so this la the problem with getting any case there before this last Supreme Court session was that Justice Kennedy was on board and he was a a, 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 a a probably a hostile vote for most of the second amendment cases that that were being that had, that have been working their way up through the system. So, uh Cases have been repeatedly turned down, much to the disappointment and, frankly, frustration of Justice Thomas, Justice Scalia when he was around, uh, Justice Alito, Justice Kavanaugh. They've all issued dissents saying we should be taking these cases and resolving these underlying issues that people are bringing to our attention, most predominantly the standard of review question. So uh, when Justice Kennedy dropped off, and now we've got uh, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh. We thought we had, with Roberts, a solid five justice ma majority. Remember, it takes four, case, four justices to take a case, five justices to win a case. So sometimes, interestingly enough, even if you have four justices, they won't take it because they know they don't have the fifth vote. And in ah, event, okay, wait a minute. Say, explain that again. So they, if they, well, they may have four judges you, to accept it, but they feel like they won't get five to win. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so the four won't vote to take the case because they know they can't win the case. Ah. They know it should be taken and voted on, but they don't think they have the fifth vote. So that, I think, is what was happening with when Kennedy was on the court. And then we got this New York 
City case where the New York New York City had a law that basically requires you to get a premises permit to have a gun in your house, but that premises permit does not allow you to take the gun outside of your house. Now that was different from a a may issue or shall issue kind of a situation. Uh, it was more about being able to transport your gun from your New York City house to your New Jersey vacation home or, or to go hunting or whatever uh, other legitimate use you might have. So it wasn't so much about uh, being able to carry in public for self-defense as it was being able to transport for certain limited purposes because you weren't allowed to do any of those under the New York City ordinance. So that was a smaller case. And that's important to keep in mind because it may have been why the Supreme Court decided to take that case because they didn't have to do this broad uh, holding. Uh, they, but they would still, in a sense, have been a broad holding because they would have decided the standard of review. So they would have si decided the standard of review, which then goes forward and applies in every Second Amendment case from that point on, but they would not have had to apply that standard of review to a real broad circumstance like some of these cases presented, like whether or not you have a right to carry in public for self-defense, and a jurisdiction has to give you a license to do that. So, so we were very hopeful that the New York City case would resolve the standard of review, and that all these other 10 cases that were queued up behind it would simply be uh, what's called GVR, where the court would grant those cases cert, vacate the underlying court ruling, and remand the case back. And they would basically say, uh, reconsider your ruling in this case in light of our decision in the New York City case. Well, but we didn't get the New York City case. So then the question was, because oh, they declared it moot, right. which was a whole nother little sideshow, procedural sideshow, and another legal issue that the court was split up on. But in any event, it was left with these 10 cases. And so we were very hopeful that it was going to take the Rogers case. I predicted it would take the Rogers case because that's the New Jersey uh, refusal, the requirement in New Jersey that you demonstrate some kind of a special need, like a stalker or something, before you can get a permit to carry a gun in public. So that's, a, that's an issue that there's a pronounced split of circuit opinion about. In the Ninth Circuit and in some other circuits, they can require a special need. In District of Columbia and Illinois, they can't require a special need. And so there is this split. And that is conventionally, typically, what the Supreme Court bases its decision to grant cert, grant a writ of certiorari and accept a case for review on. A split of circuit opinion. That's what the Supreme Court is there to resolve. That's what it was called upon to do in the Rogers case. Rogers v. New Jersey. I predicted it would take that case. It didn't take that case or any of the other uh, 10. And that's the case where Thomas and Kavanaugh both dissented and said, we should have taken this case. There is this split. The Second Amendment is not a second class right. We should resolve the issues. We should make it clear for the uh, lower courts that they are applying our Heller and McDonald precedent in the wrong way. Uh, but they didn't. So now we're left with the question of why not? And it seems like the reason is Judge Justice Roberts. So what does he want? Uh, why didn't he want to take Rogers or any of the other 10 cases while they would take the New York City case? And the answer seems to be that sort of the consensus that's building to the extent there is one is that he's looking for a narrow issue. He's looking for a small issue, not public carry generally, maybe transport. So I don't know that we have another transport case queued up. So what other cases might there be? Well, there's one case pending in the Supreme Court right now, which might get their attention. It's the Rodriguez versus San Jose case. This is uh, Lori Rodriguez, wife married to a guy who was prohibited from owning firearms, but she had firearms locked up in her safe. She was not prohibited. He did not have the combination. So he, uh, he did not possess those firearms. But nonetheless, the police seized all of her firearms because her husband was prohibited. And they would, and then even after they resolved all the issues about, about him, they wouldn't give them back. That's a huge problem in California. The, the, the seizure of firearms that are not evidence and are not contraband. It's one yeah, but thing, they're never returned. They're never given back. They're never given back. Never right. given back. 
so it's one thing if, you know, if, if, if they seize drugs, heroin from someone, uh, you're not getting your heroin back. It's contraband. Uh, but these guns are not illegal. I, I, I mean, if they're, yeah, if they're legally owned, weapons, right, right. They're legally owned. They're legally possessed. They're not evidence because he didn't possess them. She did. Uh, so why aren't you giving them back? And uh, that's a problem that's been historically and currently a, a, a huge pr- a burden for anyone defending a criminal case or trying to get property back. I've handled dozens of these. I have one case sitting in the Ninth Circuit right now that hopefully will straighten some of this stuff out. But in the meantime, the Rodriguez case is in the Supreme Court right now, uh, and the Supreme Court might take it. The thing is, it's really more of a Fourth Amendment seizure case than a Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms case. But the court could, if it wanted to, inject the Second Amendment as an issue because it sort of beefs up the Fourth Amendment claim because now you're not just seizing their property, you're seizing property that they have a fundamental individual right to have, even though you kind of have a right to own property regardless. But the point is, the Supreme Court could use it as a vehicle if it wanted to and conceivably use it to decide the standard of review issue. And well, I particularly think everybody since you, on that court... Okay, so right. you, you said that the, you, we do have a fundamental right to own property, but it's not necessarily articulated in the Bill of Rights, where, the, where firearms, it is. Right. But more specifically and expressly, yes. Yeah. So, so yeah, th- there's, a, there's a sort of a, of a leverage to get uh, that case accepted. And it's the only one that has any Second Amendment issues that's pending in the Supreme Court right now. So that case, uh, as we all probably learned from watching the 10 cases, the Supreme Court has conferences. They have basically meetings every Thursday where they vote on whether or not to take a case, grant or deny, cert or do whatever else they're going to do. And then on Monday, they published the orders that came from those meetings and those votes at those meetings. So I think the next meeting for Rodriguez is, it's either, I think it's this Thursday. So we should, it might be, I'm I'm not perfectly clear on that. But uh, in any event, they're going to have a meeting one Thursday and on Monday, they're going to tell us if they take it. I'm, I'm hopeful, but it's not. Well, you just can't get it. I mean, it's kind of weird when you start trying to predict what they'll do because they'll oftentimes they just surprise the tar out of you and they do yeah. something else. And, and, and Roberts is a wild card and he's showing that not just by the way, in second amendment cases, he's, he's the wild card in a number of these cutting edge, edge, edge cases. You know, the uh, uh, civil rights employment act case that found that uh, uh, it applies to uh, LGBTQ uh, folks. Uh, Roberts probably led that. And so we don't really know what, uh, the, 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 the Obamacare case that he sw- switched sides. We don't, we don't really know exactly where he's coming from. Um, and we don't know why and whether he has some kind of a timing in mind because of the election or whatever. But so, you know, that begs the question, what do we do next? Well, we're not, we can't give up. We're not giving up sooner or later. Now it'll at least be one year later. The Supreme court's going to have to address this. Uh, you know, justice Ginsburg, is not in good health. This well, well, that brings of, up a, a. I'm sorry, I shouldn't inter- interrupt. I suppose, but it no, does go bring ahead. Up some, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling. Does bring up some. That's okay. I do that a lot. <laughs> the older I get, the rumble, the more I ramble. I do have some questions. One you just brought up, and then some others as well. Uh, but before I get to the one you just brought up, the, the idea of the narrow holding. You mentioned that before. That it may be that Roberts doesn't want to do something that's overbroad in his mind. He wants to do something that's narrow. Is that is that a traditionally common thing with the Supreme Court to try to issue narrow rulings rather than broad strokes and then let the court Absolutely. let the yes. courts below then make those broader rulings? They want to take baby steps. That's typically what they do. They don't like these big blockbuster uh, 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 rulings. Uh, they only do a few of those out of all the cases they do every uh, session, and it's because they have to. Uh, so, and, and besides, Establishing a standard of review to use in Second Amendment cases, clarifying that, that is big. That's big enough. So what he'd want, probably want to do is say, the test is going to be originalism, text, history, and tradition. What did the founders intend when they passed the Bill of Rights uh, and the Second Amendment? Then they'll say, okay, now that we've made it clear, lower courts, what the standard of review is, now you apply it to the the legal challenges that are brought to you. And then we'll see what you think. And then we'll evaluate 
your rulings and maybe take it another step. But, but just deciding and defining and declaring a standard of review is in its own right a very, very big uh, uh, ruling decision that will clarify well, that would hopefully clarify a lot of th- clarify a lot of things. Although, not necessarily, because if you look at the Duke Fi- Duke University Firearms Law Center, Bloomberg is already ginning up a lot of scholarship to try and say that you know it was very ca- common to ban public carry of firearms, and you know they're they're trying to make it sound like the founders never intended to to uh, uh, have any kind of a broad Second Amendment right anyway. Uh, so there's a lot of revisionist history going on. Well, I'm not going uh, to statues as part of that, too, for that matter. But that's a whole different subject. You know, is it, it – was Heller not – you know, we, we go back to Heller quite frequently and looking at the, the dissents in the recent decision not to grant cert to any of these cases – one of the things that brought that has been brought up on a number of occasions by I think by Thomas um, has been the idea that the lower courts are not applying Heller correctly. Correct. Did Scalito articulate a standard of review or or the idea of a yeah, standard of review in Heller? Rep- yes, and he expressly rejected. Basically, they have a two part test right now where they first determine whether or not it's within the scope of the Second Amendment right to begin with. And they try and narrow that to Heller only said that the Second Amendment applies in the home. And so even though that completely ignores what bear arms means, not just keep arms, uh, they're trying to say that the scope of the right is limited to firearm possession in the home. And then so if, if you're dealing with uh, rights to bear arms outside the home, then you get almost no protection. So there's this two step sliding scale uh, standard of review, which is essentially intermediate scrutiny that Scalia expressly rejected, Breyer advocated for, and Scalia expressly rejected in Heller, but they slapped a fake mustache on it and called it something different, and now have been using that as the standard of review in cases, uh, uh-huh. in Second Amendment cases ever since. So he, he attempted to resolve this in, in Heller, but they've played games with it is basically what you're saying. Yes, this is basically judicial disobedience because there are ideologically biased justices uh, and judges on certain federal appellate courts that don't like Heller and that are very hopeful and, and so are really trying to read it in ways that it was never intended to be read. Uh, to uh, uphold all kinds of uh, uh, infringements on the right to keep and bear arms. Is there a remedy with those judicially, those activist judges other than no. trying to get their cases to the Supreme Court or get the, the Supreme That's Court it. to clarify? They have lifetime appointments. Uh, the remedy is to, to, to get more conservative justices on those courts. And that's what Trump has been doing in the Ninth Circuit and in other circuits so that the Ninth Circuit is now almost 50-50. In fact, it might be a little more heavily weighted towards conservative justices, uh, judges rather than liberal judges. It used to be two to one uh, Democrat direction, versus right. Republican appointees. So you could never, you almost never get a good panel, a good three judge panel in the Ninth Circuit. That's changed. Uh, you know, we just had the Duncan oral argument about uh, whether or not it's a Second Amendment violation to ban the possession of magazines that can hold over 10 rounds. And we got uh, two, two conservative judges on that panel. And we're very hopeful that, that that's going to go our way. Uh, and that's a direct result of the Trump administration appointing good judges, uh, pro second amendment judges to uh, the ninth circuit and other circuit courts and district courts for that matter. Which brings up a couple of sta- I mean, obviously I, and I'm, and full disclosure here, I voted for president Trump the first time I will vote for him again. Now, I realize that there are Second Amendment people who will raise arguments about that. Well, he did this and he did that. What about the bump stock and so on? Um, oh, yeah. And I, and I get that. Get perfect candidate. No, he made, no I, so far worse. I was born during the, Eisen, or during the Dwight Eisenhower administration. That's how many presidents I've lived through. Okay. I've never voted for or voted against a president or any politician with whom I agreed 100%. And that's never going to happen. Chuck, I think you're one of the greatest guys I've ever met, but you and I are not always going to agree on things. 
My son, who's my son, we don't always agree on things. So, yeah, there's certain things that Trump does that I don't agree with, but I will vote for him again. But without that being any kind of a sway or whatever, you know, obviously, I expect you to tell me what you think. How important is it that Trump be reelected as far as the Second Amendment in this battle is concerned? Oh, it's it's absolutely critical. I mean, first of all, let me give a quick hat tip to the NRA for getting helping get him elected the first time. Absolutely. You can give him a great big hat tip if you like. That's OK. There you go. That's that. That should be their core mission from this point on to get him reelected. Uh, Ginsburg will probably not make it another four years. So either Trump or Biden will appoint a new Supreme Court justice and we want it to be Trump. And 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 if you thought that whatever dumb things Trump may have said about bump stocks or red flag laws or whatever else he talked about, if you think those are I mean, do you really need to rehash? You heard what Biden said. You heard him talking about putting Beto O'Rourke, the I'm coming for your AKs and ARs to your door and ste- and take them from you. He's talking about putting him on his gun control uh, 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 committee or whatever the heck he's going to do. I mean, they will be aggressively pushing gun control uh, at every level, whether it's through executive order from the presidency or the House or the Senate, whatever they can take. And I mean, that this is their ag- this is their agenda. I hate to make every presidential election like a referendum on the future of the country. But it is. But it is. Uh, the Clinton Trump election was a referendum. If Trump, if Clinton had got in, we'd be in deep crap right now. Trump has salvaged a lot of it, but there's still more to do, especially now with the with the issues on the Supreme Court. But Trump is not going to. Trump isn't. Biden will bend over backwards to push more gun control laws and try and make it hard. They want to wrap us up in court. They want to wrap us up with our lobbyists in the legislature. They want to overwhelm us with so much baloney that we can't fight against it all. We can't, we don't have the resources to fight back against all of it. Uh, you know, back to the Supreme Court though, you mentioned a couple of other things. Do the dissents written by the by Thomas and Kavanaugh, do they carry any judicial or legal weight or are they more just an expression of dissent on their part? Can somebody you essentially can refer to, to them, them and say- you, you, we, we do refer to them. We cite to those in some of our briefs occasionally because particularly depending on what judge you're writing the brief for, they have more or less respect for what Kavanaugh and Thomas or Alito say. Uh, and so, yeah, it, but it's not mandatory authority. Uh, uh, the case wasn't accepted. So all they're doing is expressing their individual opinions, which is not binding on any lower court. So it's nice uh, to have them said, opine, but nobody has to yeah, abide by because they're that. making clear that you can read that there are four judges there who don't agree with the way the lower courts are applying Heller and McDonald. And so it makes it easier for judges, if not to rule for the Second Amendment, than at least to dissent when if there's, if there's a majority of judges ruling against the Second Amendment. So it, it's very helpful when they do that. It's given us a, a window into what the Supreme Court is thinking, although not in too much detail. They can't disclose, you know, internal uh, uh, machinations. But it's very helpful, and it can be helpful to lower court judges too. Is this is this something that's? It seems to me that well, I'm just going to ask: Is this a normal practice, or has this been happening more lately than it had been before? Dissents, the dissents from from cert denials are yeah. rare. They're very rare. They're very rare. There has to be a fairly high profile and profound issue that a couple that some judges really care about before they'll write a dissent to a cert denial. What, what can we draw from that being more being done more now than we, if anything, than it was before? The Second Amendment's being taken seriously by at least four judges. And that was obvious ever since McDonald. Because when we or any other group for that matter tried to get a Second Amendment case accepted by the by the Supreme Court, they were ordering briefing. Ordinarily, remember, 99 out of uh, 100 cases are just perfunctorily denied. You get a one sentence letter that says cert denied. If you're a smart Supreme Court practitioner and your opponent asks the Supreme Court to take a case, you don't submit anything opposing that because the odds are you don't need to submit anything. They're just going to deny it regardless. 
Uh, so when the Supreme Court is has been taking or looking presented with Second Amendment cases, they have been actually ordering the opposing counsel to submit an opposition. That shows right there that they're taking an interest beyond what they take in an ordinary case where they don't even ask for us an opposing brief. They just deny the brief that requested cert out of hand. So they've, that's, the, that's been the trend ever since McDonald. They were asking for that input from folks uh, f so they would hear both sides of whether to take a case. Unfortunately, they still never took a case, but the fact that they're asking for those briefs indicates they're paying attention. And then when they're issuing dissents, these, these fairly rare dissents uh, in Second Amendment cases from, and they're rotating kind of some different judges, it shows that there is a big split of opinion on the Supreme Court, and it didn't take much about whether or not to take a Second Amendment case, and it didn't take much to realize that Roberts was the problem after this last round. How, how does that explain, and this is what I'm trying to figure out, is if they, if they kept these cases for a long time. I mean, they let them sit there well, without making really. a decision for a long time. Why, why is, is that common? And if not, why, why would you no, suppose they do that? Explainable because they had the New York City case. If they had ruled on the New York City case the, re, the way we expected, they would have taken all 10 of those cases and done a GVR, a grant vacate and remand. They would have said, okay, we just decided this New York City case. We've established what the appropriate standard of review is. Now you know the rules. So on each of these 10 remaining cases, we're going to grant cert, we're going to vacate your order, and we're going to remand that case back to you, lower court. Now, go read our New York City case decision and rewrite your opinion to conform with what we said in New York City. So they had all those cases backed up because they expected they were going to rule in New York and that would, and then all those cases would have just been sent back to the lower court for reconsideration, basically. So really, so our hope... Otherwise, they wouldn't sit on that, that long. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. It, it sounds to me like... I mean, the, the Supreme Court doesn't take very many cases every year anyway, because just time and space and place, right? I mean, so one out what, of a hundred or less. So most of these things would be eventually the Second Amendment cases are going to be the vast majority of them decided at lower courts somewhere, either a district court or a local, whatever, not at the Supreme Court. So is the hope then, let's see, make sure I'm saying this right, is, is the goal then to have the court hopefully clarify what Justice Scalito tried to do, which is enforce clearly a standard of review and then let, and then because the majority of the cases are going to be decided at the lower courts anyway, at least that gives us a, a standardization of how they're going to be decided yes. so that we can overturn those things. Is that what we're trying to do? Yes. Yes. We need the Supreme Court to tell the lower courts that you've been doing it wrong and here's the right way to do it. And once the Supreme Court does that, then it becomes, uh, it's the Second Amendment renaissance. Then it becomes all these cases in the last 10 years that have been decided against us are all now subject to relitigation and reconsideration now under the proper standard. They set the bar higher, and a lot of the cases where they, the lower courts set a very low bar can be relitigated. And, and those laws can be challenged based on the new standard that the Supreme Court sets. So yeah, one case from the Supreme Court kind of is a reboot on all of the cases that have been decided against us since McDonald came down. Are you saying that it's a reboot in the sense that it wipes all those cases out or then it gives no, no, us no. an opportunity then to go they, back and refight them? You can fight them again. You file another lawsuit on the same issue because now the the ruling that they issued previously is, is basically wrong. So you file another lawsuit on many of the same issues and you should get a different result because the Supreme Court has changed the rules. How, how possible is it that with Scalito having to, they, he tried to do this to begin with, with Scalia tried to do this to begin with, and now if the court tries to do it again and clarifies it more, is this judicial disobedience still possible where these lower courts decide i'm not going to obey that on, it depends on whether they leave any weasel weasel room in the in the in the opinion you know uh, and that might also be another reason why roberts is looking 
to, to not get too narrow of a, of a underlying issue in front of them just to set the, 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 uh, you mean too broad because you said too, too broad, narrow, too broad. Yes. Too, too broad. broad. Okay. So you don't want, he doesn't want to he go too broadly to focus on the standard of review and then let the lower courts wrestle with it. And they will, they will, they will apply the originalism test, go to that Duke university firearms law center website. You can see how they're already queuing it up to have a counter argument and try and say that even if you apply this different standard of review, the law is still constitutional. So there will this, the next case to the Supreme Court will not be the last Second Amendment case to the Supreme Court. There will be more. So the truth oh, is, well, my we, kids' kids are going to be fighting this battle. We can't give up. We can't stop. Oh, absolutely, we can't. I stop. mean, we're going to be fighting this battle till the end of time, and so there is no real end to it. It's a, it's a, it's a battle that is never going to end, and we need to steal ourselves for that. I mean, that's that's true of all. All the rights. That's the First Amendment. You know, there was a flurry of litigation, and then, and then it. Uh, at once, they try and get most of the general rules nailed down. There's still more litigation that goes on all the time. It, 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 it yes, it never ends because the cases become more and more refined and more and more uh, uh, unique. But still, a lot of the underlying, a lot of the more general cases get knocked out and they're not litigated anymore. So, uh, you know, you can't, Roe v. Wade says you can't ban abortion entirely. And so now, however many years later, we're still litigating about whether or not they can regulate where a Planned Parenthood clinic has to be or what kind of license they have to have or those kind of issues. But yes, the Second Amendment, and, and it will go on for uh, uh, several decades, I expect. And that's one of the reasons why I'm really working to form a, uh, sort of a smart panel, the A-team, so to speak, of, of lawyers, Second Amendment lawyers with experience and get behind uh, a nonprofit organization that can raise funds to litigate these cases. And that's what the Second Amendment Law Center is all about. It's a counter to the Duke University Firearms Law Center. And it's a way for all of the attorneys, the legitimate attorneys, the A-team attorneys, the ones that have been litigating Second Amendment cases for a long time, like Steve Hallbrook, the lawyers with my firm, uh, a, a number of other uh, folks that have been doing this will be on the advisory committee of this nonprofit entity because the reality is it's very easy for to form a nonprofit these days and it's very easy to do a Facebook or a, or a social media fundraising campaign or buy an email list and send out e mass emails. You can make yeah. yourself sound like you're really working for the Second Amendment and a lot of that money never actually gets where it needs to be to do the most good. Right. So I want to I want to try and uh, let people know about a legitimate way to support the efforts to uh, continue the fight for the Second Amendment at all, at all levels, the Supreme Court and every level below, and not and, and in California and other states too, um, uh, so that you know the money's well spent and it's not going into some uh, administrative heavy or or frankly, salary heavy. Uh, that's a lot of the problem. You're paying for admin. 97% of the money goes to salaries and admin. All you're doing is making people rich, but you're not fighting your battle. There's nothing left to really put into the fight. So right. the, these lawyers, you know, have done it before. They're very efficient and uh, there's very little admin overhead. Basically, it's a clearinghouse. Uh, so uh, we can get the money into the law firms. Is that something that you're doing that's new or has that been around for a while? Uh, no, it's new, uh, uh, and it's needed because of this. Whether it, we thought it would be last Supreme Court session, it'll probably be the next one. Uh, but there's this need for sort of a centralized, legitimate, uh, uh, with legitimate uh, Second Amendment experts, scholars, lawyers, litigators on it uh, that can kind of try and help fund worthwhile cases. Uh, to advance the Second Amendment cause. There's a lot of splinter groups out there raising money off lawsuits, some of which are smart and some of which are really dumb. Uh, and there's a lot of unqualified lawyers who are bringing cases because, you know, every lawyer dreams about going to the show. They all want to argue in the Supreme Court. It's a highlight of, uh, of a legal career if you get there. Yeah, but you do a lot of damage if you don't do it right. That's right. And there's, and it really, I mean, I, I would not take, I would not argue a case to the United States Supreme Court with all my experience, all my years, because you have to be ready for that argument to go off on some tangent that unless you've done it a lot, unless you really are familiar with the entire scope of constitutional law, not just second amendment, law, 
all of them. Uh, you can get surprised. You can say the wrong thing. You can get hammered. So mm. it's just, I mean, you have to shut down your practice for at least three months before you take a case, before you're ready to argue a case in the Supreme Court if you've never done it before. Wow. Now you, okay, so you've alluded to this now a couple times, so I just want to make sure that we're being clear here. It sounds like one of your concerns is that there are organizations or groups out there that are, for lack of a better reason, a, a statement, they're being disingenuous and they're they're working to... Um, to raise funds, but that that might be a waste of people's time if they put money in there. Is that what we're and talking it's not about? Just, it's not just Second Amendment. I mean, there's a lot of, look, it's, this is true for every cause, not just gun rights, not well, just sure. gun owner yeah. rights. Uh, this, the, this the whole social media and email fundraising campaign system has gotten to the point where people can pick a cause, pretend like they're influencing that cause, mm -hmm. and then raise money by telling people that if you give us money, we will try and ar we will argue for the cause you believe in. And so there are groups out there raising money for to fight federal uh, legislation, gun control legislation, when they don't have a presence in the in the Capitol. I mean, the only <laughs> group that really has a presence in the in Washington, D.C. is the NRA. GOA has yeah, a few as far as a far as a, a full time, full time uh, representation. What do they call them? A lobbyist, team, yeah. a team with yeah. access and influence. Nobody else does. And they're all out there yeah. fundraising because they think, well, we'll submit a petition. You know, that's what they do to, to, to justify what they're say, saying they're doing. They submit a petition, which sits in a hallway and gathers dust and then gets thrown away. I mean, you know, money's tight. We work hard to make it. You want to put it where it has meaning. So I applaud what you're doing. How can I, what can I do, Chuck, to help you with the, with the, uh, um, the Second Amendment Law Center? Because well, I know you, back. and I know you're not full of beans, and I know if you're putting this together, you got the right heart, and you're going to take the money and use it properly. So well, let me come back when we get the website up, so people can I can actually yeah. direct. We have the website. We've got the approval letter from IRS to accept uh, tax deductible donations. I just have to make clear to people what it is we're doing and why, okay. and also who's involved in it. And so we're writing all that up. We'll be populating the the website shortly. And when we do, you should have me back and we can, you know, put the website up, show people and go through all of the things that it. That Absolutely. It, you bet. Oh. We're happy to do it. Now, you gave me a cheat sheet here. By the way, if you're watching this and you think I'm just a great interviewer and I'm really, really smart. No, it's because Chuck sent me a cheat sheet. Look, can we talk about these things? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for making me look brilliant, Chuck. I really appreciate it. You had mentioned, in addition, some of the things we talked about, that there are some other cases I saw an article uh, in, I don't know whether it was Ammo Land or The Truth About Guns or one of those websites, that either yesterday or today or within the last few days, that there are a number of Second Amendment cases sort of bubbling up, hopefully to reach the Supreme Court uh, for um, at, at some point. Do we, do we well, know what those are? That's been true for 10 years. I mean, we have the cases in California, which I work on primarily, which is the Duncan case. That's a magazine ban. The Rody case, which is the ammunition background check ban or, or requirement and the internet sales ban. Uh, there's uh, um, some other cases across the country. There's one in Chicago, in Illinois, I believe, where it's a tax issue. And so maybe the Supreme Court would want to take like a poll tax case and set, and set the standard of review in the context of whether or not the state can impose a tax on your right to keep and bear arms or to buy ammunition. Uh, so, uh, uh, there's that, there's the Rodriguez case that I mentioned about firearm seizures. Um, uh, there's, uh, there are always the public carry cases working their way through, but I don't think th they have much ca chance in light of the fact of the denial of Rogers. There, I, 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 the other more minor esoteric type issues are slipping my mind right now in the cases that are working their way up, but that's the Kind of thing. It's it's sort of unrelated to what you might think of as the core right to bear arms, and it's an opportunity for a, a fairly minor ruling. I mean, if the court says the tax is unconstitutional, that's not all that ground shaking, that earth shaking. But if they do it in the context of setting the standard of review, that's still the thing that you can take back and apply in all the other contexts. So you just have to watch what makes its way, what percolates up through the lower courts and makes its way back to the Supreme Court for review. And it might be one we win. It might want be one that comes out of the Ninth Circuit that we win. That'll be interesting to see 
Because remember when we won in D.C. in the District of Columbia over the right to carry and or the right to bear, I should say, uh, the District of Columbia decided not to go to the Supreme Court because they thought they would lose. So we might get some good rulings in the lower courts, too, that then become binding precedent. So we're, you know, the Second Amendment Law Center will be a national effort. We still have in California the CRPA and the CRPA Foundation, which is funding right now half a dozen lawsuits, uh, Second Amendment lawsuits that we've won in the lower court, and that we have a lot of uh, 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 momentum and chances for success on. So, you know, we're, all we can do is we, we keep slogging away, we keep fighting, and uh, and winning enough to make it worth the effort. California seems to be, for many years, it's been sort of an incubator for anti-gun stuff. Oh, God, yeah. But in the courts, in fact, that's got to be the understatement of the century. But in, And it still is, because I know they're, I'm going to have uh, Sam and Rick come on later to talk about cases here, in, or a le- litigation, or not litigation, legislation here in California. But mm-hmm. um, it now in the courts, because we have judges like Judge Benitez, and we have... Um, the changing and the shape of the Ninth Circuit, it seems like it might be an incubator for some pro Second Amendment things and actually some victories. Or is is that your take on it as well, or is it just me? Absolutely, absolutely. That is that is possible now, perhaps even likely, and that's a hell of a lot better than it used to be, which is almost impossible. That's how it used to be. So yes, and 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 ironically, you know, the Ninth Circuit is probably one of the circuits that takes the longest to get get through a case and decide a case and that's not necessarily a bad thing now that we want to get to back to the supreme court maybe with a new supreme court justice but out of all this should come the lesson that this next presidential election is absolutely critical to to hold on to that supreme court and these lower courts so that we can get some wins uh in both places I have read uh, Democratic politicians' opinions that what they would like to do is increase the number of justices on the Supreme Court because they don't like the ones that are there now. want to water it down, yeah. Right. So I I don't understand, and maybe you can help uh, me understand, I don't understand, do they actually have the power to do that? Um, in the in the legislature, and if so, how? What's the process, and is that easy to do, or is that uh, is that a lot know, of is that a lot of wind, but not necessarily an easy thing to accomplish? Uh, well, it, I don't know that much about that process, other than you need to have the v- votes to do it, <laughs> and they don't obviously right now because the Senate will never vote for that. But well, if then you have to have a president vote, that would sign for it, I would think, wouldn't you? Because it's, it's, ch- it's, it's an actual change in a law. It's a law that has to be yes, passed, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Yes. And it's happened in the past. The Supreme Court has not always stood at nine justices. So it has been changed before. And uh, But uh, it's also failed multiple times before on other issues, not the Second Amendment. So, uh, But it's a possibility. Uh, uh as difficult as it may be, and it's not something we really want to face. How much damage to our, to the Second Amendment cause could a Biden presidency actually do? Oh, he could put it in a box, and it would never get out of it. Conceivably, I mean, he he could he could he could uh, pass so many bad laws that it's impossible to keep up with the court challenges to, to try and stop them all. He could conceivably uh, uh, do whatever it takes, who knows what, to influence Justice Roberts, but also to replace Justice Ginsburg with a very, very anti-gun uh, justice and just adopt policies, executive orders. I mean, it, we talked earlier about red tap- taping the right to death, and that's sort of the strategy. They can pay lip service oh, we believe in the Second Amendment, we respect the Second Amendment, but then behind their back, they're passing every single thing that can be passed to give the government more power to restrict your rights. That, that's, that's the game that politicians play with every cause. They say one thing and they do something entirely different, and Biden would be doing a lot of things that would hurt us. 
there are, I'm going to make this, this is a statement, not a question, and then I'm going to ask a question. There are an, a lot, a lot of attorneys in the state of California, for example, which are, who have a more liberal political vent, bent, and they're, they're not, they're anti-gun in many cases, and they're very, that's what they are. Uh, and they may be excellent attorneys in the particular area of law that you need, but they're they're not supporting your rights. On the other hand, Chuck's firm is outstanding, and they do support your rights. So this is why I'm going to ask him this question. I want you to think about putting your money, if you need an attorney, with, a, with somebody who's actually supporting your rights. Chuck, what kind of law work does your – because you don't make a dime from CRPA. What kind of law work – uh, legal well, cases. I don't want to, I don't want to mislead anybody. The CRPA does pay us something for the Second Amendment law. No, no, I meant as being president. No, as being yeah, president. No, when you, not, when you're working, but I, I also know this too, that you you give discounts to the CRPA and you do a lot of extra work. Very so big know. discounts. And right. I do a lot. We do a lot of pro bono work, pro Second Amendment pro bono work. What people need to realize is that a lot of these big firms have pro bono departments. And if they're representing a city like the city of L.A., I mean, I used to work for O'Melveny and Myers. They do a lot of work for the city of LA. They get this municipal bond work. And then when the city of LA says, well, help us with this gun control ordinance, they do that pro bono. There's a lot of big firms that are doing anti-Second Amendment pro bono work. You have to choose your legal service provider carefully and make sure that you're not subsidizing uh, the gun ban lobby. Uh, but we do we do labor and employment law. We do... Uh, uh, we even do personal injury now. I got I brought on a, a partner who does uh, uh, some catastrophic injury cases. Go to michellelawyers.com and check out our website, uh, and you'll see the, all the practice areas there. Uh, I'll put a link but, in the description so you'll be able to find it. You don't have to go Google it. When in doubt, just call us. We give everybody a free consultation. Or shoot us an email at helpdesk at michellelawyers.com. We'll tell you, if we can't do it, and we don't try and take cases that we're not qualified to do, if we can't do it, we'll try and help you find somebody who can do it right for you and that won't take advantage and that will get you a good result. Chuck, thank you very much for all of your help and for taking the time to do this. Your time is very valuable, and I'm grateful that you took the time to spend with me today and uh, and to keep us informed. It's, a, it's, a, it's something I'm very grateful that you're willing to do. And we will My have pleasure. you back on once you get the second amendment. Well, you get the website up for the Second Amendment Law Center. Yep. Let me know. Uh, mm -hmm. And if there's you got anything else that you want to get the word out for really quickly, then uh, give me a shout or have Rick call me or or whatever. And Absolutely. you've got my cell phone number, so don't you know don't feel um, don't feel like you're pestering me because this is a big deal as far as I'm concerned as it is for you. Thank you again very much for all of your support of Gun Guy TV. I appreciate you. If you, if you stuck with us this long, you're really a Second Amendment supporter because you waded through this entire interview, which hopefully helped you understand a little bit more about what's happening to fight for your Second Amendment rights in the courts. It certainly helped me. And I do look forward to Chuck coming back on and talking about the uh, the new law center, the Second Amendment law center he's starting, among other things. Now, I'm looking forward also to having Rick Travis from the California Rifle and Pistol Association on the show here in the next, well, probably in the next week or so. And then also my uh, my very good friend Sam Paredes from Gun Owners of California. So hopefully we'll have some information for you with regard to all the legislation we're facing in California, but also across the nation. Thank you again very much for all of your support. Have a great week and wherever you go, whatever you do, please be safe. <laughs>